Corinthians chapter 15, really Paul's dissertation on the resurrection here. We're going to start in verse 28. I'll read a couple verses. I'll make our prayer, and then we'll go through the study. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 28. And when all this, when all, all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus I, our Lord. I die daily." Verse 32, if after the men, manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantageth it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Be not deceived, evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these few words here this evening. God, I pray as we open up your word that the Spirit of God would open up our hearts and our minds, and God, we would be fully vested in what you're trying to do in and through our lives. God, take the people in this room and uh, God, mold us and make us in a, in, a, in a way, in a fashion that's pleasing unto you, and uh, may we be the salt and the light. God, may we be uh, a city that's set on a hill that's not hid. God, may we show this culture what uh, uh, living a full life is truly all about. Bless us now, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so back in verse 28, uh, we actually covered this verse the last time we were in this text, but uh, before I jump into verse 29, I wanted the reminder, if you will, that he says that God may be all in all, and what a powerful text for us to consider uh, all that is taking place in this world, in our life, that Christ is supposed to be the all in all, whether it is sicknesses or finances or whether it's in our marriages or whether it's parenting or politics, he is supposed to be the sovereign king. He's supposed to be the, the center of it all, the foundation, the air that we breathe, the reason that we live, the purpose that we have, the, the all in all, as Paul has said right here. So he, he's, he's not asking that, you know, it's God first and my marriage second and then my work third or whatever it is or however you like. He says, hey, listen, it's God. That's all then all, okay? So it's not a little section here and a little section there. It's God is the reason for my marriage, the reason reason why I work, the reason why I live, the reason why I have finances, the reason why I go on vacation, the reason why I eat. He's my all in all. Now we get into this next text, and uh, it uh, really is a dissertation on the, the resurrection, uh, and, and, and really what he's trying to do is help us to see the eternality, the value, the long-term view, the perspective of life is more than just the 70 years that we uh, are expected to have in this life, but it is forever. It is eternal. And the resurrection brings to light that understanding and help us to focus more on the priority of living for the forever, not just for the today. Billy Graham, if you saw in the news today, uh, died at the age of 99. A lot of people on social media and on the news and actually the Democrat and Chronicle called the church today wanting to interview us to see what we thought the impact of Billy Graham was in our nation uh, and in our community. And at staff meeting, we talked about Billy Graham and one of the ladies in our staff, I didn't know this, she said, she said I got saved because of Billy Graham. And I thought, what? And she said, my parents had put me to bed and they went in the other room and were listening to the radio and Billy Graham came on the radio and started preaching the message of the gospel. And she said, while she, her parents were in the other room, the doors closed, she was listening through that and she heard the gospel and repented and believed in the name of Jesus Christ. I mean, he has, I remember in the, I think it was 1988, I'm not sure exactly the year, but I remember my parents took me to the War Memorial and we went to see Billy Graham. And I can remember going in there thinking, this is, ma this is huge, right? Tens of thousands of people were there to hear this man preach and, and he preached this message and, and all of a sudden there's streams of people going down to the altar and, and bowing. And I thought, at the time, I, I was pretty young, I didn't really know what was happening, but man, this guy was used of the Lord to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said this. I thought this was a good quote. He said, someday you will read or hear that Billy Graham is dead. Don't believe a word of it. I shall be more alive than I am now. 
I will just have changed my address. I will have gone into the presence of God. You know, I believe why Billy Graham lived such a full and robust, a life with texture and purpose. It's because of that statement right there. He lived with eternity in view, with really understanding what this is all about. It's not about the 70 years or the 50 years or the 99 years that we are going to get on this, on this world. It's about the infinite life that we have and what we are going to do. We look in uh, the book of Matthew or I should say the Gospel of Matthew, the narrative written by Matthew of the, of the life of Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 17, there's a story of Jesus coming up on the Mount of Transfiguration. And as Jesus gets up onto the top of that mountain, all of a sudden the, uh, the veil is opened up in there and Elijah and Moses appear. You know what that tells you right there? That although Moses and Elijah uh, were dead on earth, they are alive in eternity. And not only were they alive in eternity, they weren't simply absorbed into the deism of life, right? They weren't simply uh, absorbed into the life cycle. They looked and they said, that's Moses and that one's Elijah. They knew who they were. And listen, you and I, when we enter into eternity, we are not somehow so amazingly changed that nobody recognizes who you are and what you are. We are still going to be who we are in so many ways. Of course, uh, as we go through this chapter, we're going to see that we all will be changed. In, in the twinkling of an eye, there will be a change that takes place. But when we look, people are going to recognize who you are because there are still going to be recognizable features in all of us. That body, soul, and spirit that is so important to us will remain We are and always have been created to be eternal beings. There is a resurrection of the just and the unjust. Every person will rise again. Now we get into verse 29. This is a goofy verse. Can we just say this? This is one of these verses that you have to just kind of think to yourself, what in the world is Paul trying to, what in the world is the Spirit of God trying to say? So he says, so God may be all in all, verse 29, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they then de- baptized for the dead? So if we were to pull this verse just right out of the, out of the Bible and, 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 and make a doctrine around it, what we would say is that we should baptize for the dead, right? That we should probably start a, uh, start a system in which we read the obituaries, and as we read the obituaries, then we uh, baptize on behalf of those that have died before us. So, and in essence, that is what has taken place in some churches, okay? So as we search the Scripture, and I tried to mention this a little bit on Sunday, we are to engage our mind as we enter the church building. We are to engage our thinking as we go through the Scripture. And so in our church, we have a Bible Institute, we have life groups, we have, uh, we have Summit, we have Awana, we have Sunday School, we have a Christian school. We do all of this uh, so that we can engage the brain, okay, and not simply just believe in a nebulous idea, but that would have concrete and facts around that and, and logic and that we could live this life accordingly, okay? So when we come into this text, we're We're going to try to think this through a little bit and and, and go back through the Scripture and get an understanding of what baptism is. So this is the first term that we see here. He says, else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? Now, every time we go into the Bible and we talk about baptism, uh, we understand that baptism is always for people that are alive. Have you ever noticed that in the Scripture? that every example in the scripture of baptism, uh, people that are being baptized are actually alive. And those people that are baptized are not only alive, but they believe the gospel truth before they are baptized. Okay? And so we're not going to go through and teach baptism. We've done this a whole bunch of times. But uh, there's no place in the scripture that we see baptism as a means of saving grace. Okay? Never does a, does a person receive God's grace by being baptized in water, by being sprinkled, or any other mode 
of baptism out there. The only way a person receives grace is by repenting and by faith believing the gospel. Are you all with me? Okay, so that is, the, that is the way that's done. So when we look at infant baptism, we immediately have to say, well, infant baptism doesn't qualify because this child cannot repent and by faith believe the gospel. So automatically we're going to cut that out as, okay, we can't believe in, 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 in proxy or vicarious baptism because the, the person uh, that's supposed to be receiving of the grace is not actually there to make the decision to repent and believe. Okay, so when it comes to the grace of God, it's always an individual. It's never a corporate decision, but an individual decision that each one of us has to come to the grips of our own sin and our own need for the Savior. Are you with me? Okay? So this is, this is what, we have to, what we have to do. And, and the, the Mormons, modern day, if you want to look at a modern day example of the, the current day Mormons teach a vicarious baptism. Meaning, especially when a Mormon person dies, that in order to get them into heaven, Another Mormon is going to be re, a Mormon that's already been baptized is now going to be rebaptized in order to kind of give them a extra push into the into the afterworld. Okay, and all that, and they would use this verse to kind of support that whole thing. Okay, and and that's where we take that's where we take uh, uh, a little bit of conflict with this whole thing. And, and the reality is, okay, what is actually the purpose of the gospel if all we need to do is, is to baptize people by proxy? Like I said, just go to the newspaper and find the obituaries and start uh, uh, lining people up and baptizing them on behalf of somebody else, then we really wouldn't need to preach the gospel. We just need to be baptizing all the time, okay? So as we stop and think through this text... It can be a little bit difficult, but we cannot disregard the whole Scripture, the whole uh, uh, understanding of this theology of baptism. Now, baptism is closely associated with salvation. In the New Testament, Jesus actually tells his disciples to go out and baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The reality of Acts chapter 8, uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, we see this, this man that uh, he's interested in, and he doesn't quite understand, and so, the, uh, so he has this conversation from Isaiah chapter 53, and he preaches to him Jesus from the Scripture, and as his heart is warm towards Jesus, he says, what, what keeps me from being baptized in this water? And he says, if thou believest believe with all thine heart. And he says, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And then they stop and they both go down and they get baptized. Okay? So it's not that he just got baptized. He got, he, he, he believed and then he was baptized. But the reality in the scripture is baptism is a very close association. And it's almost, I'm not going to say it's synonymous, but it's almost synonymous with salvation because every time you see a salvation, every time you see somebody believe in their heart, there's always an action, a literal, a physical action that is required on the outside. So that's why we do baptisms in our church because it's easy to say, well, I believe something here, but it, 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 until you actually express that on the outside, it's not real for the most part. Now, I didn't just say you didn't get saved unless you get baptized, okay? Don't, don't, don't misconstrue me. What I'm saying is everywhere in the Bible that you see salvation, you see baptism. They walk hand in hand. They go together. Let's look in Romans 10, 10 real quick. <clears throat> Romans 10 and verse 9. Romans 10 verse 9 says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You see that right there? For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There's no difference between the, the Jew and the Greek for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. You see, there's no baptism in there. So the purity of the gospel, I think this is one of my favorite texts that I bring people to when I want to lead them to the Lord. I want to help them understand this truth of salvation is right here. It kind of clears the path. There's not a whole lot that needs to take place but this repentance, but this faith, but believing and, and unlocking that biblical salvation as the Spirit of God is working in our lives as the individual. Now, an infant cannot repent, and a dead person cannot repent and turn on the Lord Jesus, turn and, and by faith believe. So uh, it, it, there's no evidence in this text to be able to support the idea of baptizing dead people because the only people that truly need to be baptized are saved people, all right? So it appears that in the Corinthian church and throughout the history of the church, people have baptized for the dead, believing in this proxy baptism, if you will, that their act of baptism would somehow help those that already are deceased. There are even some churches today that would make prayers for the deceased, okay? Now, you kind of see this in social media a little bit. Somebody gets killed in a car accident or, or unexpected, you know, death or something. Somebody will say, you know, pray for, pray for this individual and the family. You know, pray for this person that just died. Uh, but you look at a lot of times people that know the Bible a little bit, they don't, they don't say pray for the person that just died, do they? They say, they say just pray for the family as they go through this whole thing because, because when a, once a person dies, that's it. There's nothing that we can do to influence that person anymore, is there? They are now to be absent from the body is to now be present with the Lord. They are now, whatever we have done, and this is why we talk about the Bible so much, this is why we think it's so very important to live a righteous life because there is going to be a day in which we all stand accountable before God as individuals to Him. Does that make sense? Okay. So we, we see that there is this uh, cultish group of people that are trying to uh, baptize, and that is trying to... Uh, uh, do this whole thing. And, and, and all throughout history, there's always going to be some sort of heresy that the church has to be careful of. And I think what Paul is actually trying to say, this is my take, and I've read a couple different commentaries, and everybody, nobody really, really agrees on this text. It really is a fairly difficult text to understand. But my take on this is that we're trying to, in chapter 15, prove the resurrection. We're, we're trying to understand that the resurrection is very real and, and, and so very important. So when we look here, he says, why are they baptized? Why are they baptizing for the dead? See, the, even these cultish people realize that there is an eternity out there, that even though these people have deceased, they are still trying to help them because there is an afterlife in all of this. So kind of my take on this text, uh, and we can talk about this later if you want, because I know there's some other views, but uh, my take on this is they are almost looking at this like Paul's almost using this cultish group as to support to say we, you, those that baptize, those that are uh, baptizing for the dead, they believe that there is an eternity past here. Why shouldn't we in all this? Now in verse 30 he goes on and say, why stand we in, in, in jeopardy every hour, and, and Paul's making the argument that what is the point of, of suffering? What's the point of sacrifice? What's the point of the troubles, the hardships? If there is no resurrection, then there's absolutely no reason to put ourselves in jeopardy. Why would David Livingston travel to the interior of Africa? Why would he leave behind his wife? Why would he get gnawed uh, uh, by a lion on the leg and almost perish? Why would he get malaria and go through all that he did if there was simply no eternity? If there's no resurrection, why would he have ever lived, lived, left the UK and gone to Africa and hazarded himself for the, for the cause of, of the gospel? Why would Jim Elliott have gone to Ecuador with his buddies? Why would they have tried to reach a very remote tribe to, to, to get the gospel there? If there really was no resurrection, there really is no need to preach a gospel because there's no benefit to anything beyond this life. 
Why would Job, who suffered terrible and uh, have confidence that there was coming a better day unless there was a resurrection? Why would Paul himself have put himself in any kind of danger? I mean, here he had his, his, his great life. He, he meets the Lord on the road to Damascus, and, the, and, and, and he repents, and he turns to Jesus Christ. I mean, why didn't he just go home and say, man, I had this cool thing happen to me today? What he did was he ended up getting tortured, beaten, shipwrecked. He, he, he got killed at one point, and, and then he revived. I mean, he got, he got bit by a snake and shook that thing off. I mean, why would he go through all in any of that if there was no resurrection? He says in verse 31, I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die daily. Again, I think here's another, creed to, uh, uh, another key to enjoying the, the Christian life is, is that self-mortification principle. This is, this is nothing short of being Christ-like, of, uh, of recognizing that I have this need to die to myself but to be alive to the things of God. That really is the ultimate goal in all of this. So let's turn to Romans chapter 6 for just a moment. It's a, chapter 6 is a great text on walking in the newness of life, about dying to myself. He says in chapter 6 and verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? The, the question is asked, well, if God's grace is so amazing, should I show his grace off by continuing in sin? Verse 2, Paul answers, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer? Know ye not that so many of us, as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him, and by baptism into death, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so also should we walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, verse 6, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for, that the, for, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he live, he liveth unto God. Likewise, verse 11, Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. You see what Paul is talking about in that chapter is yielding ourselves to God. It is in essence dying to myself, but being alive to God's will and his desire and plan for our life. The, uh, the phrase, I die daily, speaks both literally and likely metaphorically. Paul is willing to die for the gospel of Christ. Paul wakes up every morning, and it's not like he's walking out into the road and, and trying to get killed here, but at the same time, Paul is intentionally putting himself in positions of risk for the sake of the gospel, not foolishly, but faithfully that others may know Christ and the power of the resurrection. See, that's what dying daily is for Paul. Paul wasn't, Paul wasn't just saying, you know, hey, whatever happens, happens today. Paul was saying, I am going to die to my own desires that I may see others know God's power and that resurrection power because resurrection power means that there is an eternity and people shouldn't just live as if there's 70 years on life and that's it. People should live as if there was a forever and so I'm going to live my life in such a way that I die to my own life so that you may know eternity forever and ever. Now that's powerful. I think Billy Graham did that. I think we can talk about his life a little bit. Here's a man that went from city to city preaching the gospel. He went, he went to nations around the world. He met and he counseled with presidents. I mean, this was a man... 
of character. He finished his course well, as far as I can tell. I mean, you can always, if you dig hard enough, you could look for faults in people. But the things that I see that people try to uh, uh, disparage about Billy Graham, I, I think, they're, I think they're, they're just shooting for things at this point, right? Here's a man who's lived his life with integrity. He's lived his life in, with character because he sees, he saw the big picture of eternity in all this. Paul said this in, in Philippians. He says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He says in the beginning of that thing that he can't counted all things for, for loss, for Christ. Doubtless I count all things, but for the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. So we die daily where we wake up and we say, you know what? Not my will be done, God, but thy will be done this day. Uh, Whatever you want me to do, whether you want me to be a a missionary in Haiti or if you want me to be a missionary in China uh, or or if you want me to to be a missionary right here in Rochester or if you want me to give all my money to the poor or or if you want me to, to... drum, be a drummer in the church, uh, or play the piano, or, or be a preacher, or be a Sunday school teacher, or be an Awana leader, or, or sign up for, or do anything you ask me to do, God, I'm going to follow you. That's what dying daily is in all this. Uh, he's also, I think, speaking metaphorically. He dies to himself daily, to his own self, wants and needs. He, I think he dies working for the Lord, if you will. He says, I'm going to die daily. I'm going to be exhausted. If you look in the scripture, you see that, that death is often associated with sleep, right? The saints at some point are, are sleeping and the trumpet of the Lord is going to sound and, and those that are asleep are going to rise first, right? And, and so I think maybe we could say metaphorically that uh, Paul is saying, I am dying of exhaustion. What do you do when, you, when you're exhausted at night? Go to sleep, Right? You lay down, and then what happens in the morning? You rise again. It's almost a picture of the, of the death. I'm dying from exhaustion. I'm dying from the work, and I'm, uh, I'm buried, and I rise again in the morning anew and afresh to do the work that God is calling, to, uh, calling us to. Verse 32, he says, If after the manner of men I have fought with the beast at Ephesus, what advantage it me if the dead rise not? Let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. He, he, he says, listen, who cares if you were some great gladiator? Who cares if you won, you know, 10 marathons? Who cares if you got the Olympic gold in everything you did? If the dead rise not, so what? Spiritually speaking, what's the point of giving financially to the church? What's the point of going to the ends of the earth? What's the point of, uh, of Dan Jellowick creating a better system? What's the point of sending money for clean water? What's the point of, uh, of helping the hurting, crying with the weak, holding up those that are, that are fallen down, encouraging? What is the point in going into battle, getting the scars, getting the sores, wearing out? What's the point of any of that if we're simply going to die and stay dead in the grave? If there's nothing else, then he says, let's eat and let's drink because we're just going to be dead. See, that's the opposite, right? Resurrection living says, let's live to the fullest because it, it counts for all eternity. The opposite of that is, there is no anything else, and because there is no anything else, we might as well just self-consume and enjoy every ounce for me, okay? I think that's happening in our world right now. I think that's where we're at a little bit. If you look at the news, if you watch what's taking place, uh, just a little bit of st- uh, studying here, and, and this is the United, this is statistics in the United States, 25 million Americans use illegal drugs, and according to the articles, that's on the increase. We're talking heroin, cocaine, marijuana, meth, 23 million people. That's a significant amount of people in this nation that are on real drugs. We have an adrenaline culture, you know, the running of the bulls, the climbing the mountains, the, the diving with sharks, the skydiving. Uh, you know, we, we're always looking to get as close to the edge as possible, right? We, we want to we wanna 
we want to feel death, but not, not really have death, you know? That we want to just get on the edge, you know, roller coaster rides that spin you up and down and make your head pop off type of thing. And we, we want to experience all that stuff. I watched this video on YouTube today of this kid on a, on a bicycle, this little BMX bike, and he's got his little cam on, and, and, and he's on a skyscraper. He's got to be up 200 feet in the air, and he's on the ledge of this building up there, and he's just cycling along the side of this thing. And I'm thinking, where's your mama right now? <laughs> I watched this other one that these people, they climb this, this, this uh, smokestack in the Ukraine or whatever it was, right? This abandoned, and they were up there. It was, this, it was this couple, and they were just up there. You know, the smokestack was huge in it. You know, again, it had this, you know, this thing like this, and they were just walking around, and then they started doing some tricks, and they're filming each other. And we live in this adrenaline culture where really it doesn't matter what happens because in the end, there is no eternity. And if there's no eternity, then who gives a rip what happens today anyways? We can talk about alcohol consumption. 38 million people in the USA binge drink. That's not, we're not talking social drinking. We're talking binge drinking. And the definition of binge drinking is eight drinks or more at a, set, at a time. Okay. Eight drinks or more, that's the definition of binge drink according to this article right here, and that takes place at least four times a month. This article says there's 38 million people in our country that are qualified binge drinkers. That's what Paul's saying. Hey, if there's no eternity, eat, drink, you're going to be dead tomorrow. At least have a really bad hangover. 5.3 million binge drinkers Above the 38 million are from the age of 12 to 20. Alcohol is the fourth largest killer in the United States. 2,200 people or roughly six people a day die from alcohol poisoning in our country. Sounds like a great way to go, doesn't it? 97,000 people experienced alcohol-related sexual assault. Close to 700,000 people were assaulted I think this was 2015, were assaulted by someone reported to be drinking. I mean, isn't that a fantastic thing to do? Just go out and eat and drink. It's going to be great. Everything's going to be a party. I had a conversation with a lady today that uh, she, she has to wear this. She has to wear this little, I don't know what it's called. It's some kind of monitor. It actually monitors the blood level in her body. And if, 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 if the blood level, uh, if, if the alcohol level in her blood goes up at all, she goes to jail. You know, she told me, she called me today and said, I, have, I swear to you, I haven't drank a thing. And, and this monitor went off and they told me I need to report to court tomorrow and they're going to probably put me back in jail. And I said, well, why would they think that? She said, I put lotion on underneath this thing and I realized, and then, you know, they called me to tell me what happened and I looked at the back of the lotion and it said it had alcohol in it. So now she gets to go to jail because of that. I mean, she was having a great life, partying, doing everything. Everything was going really well until... She messed up a whole bunch of times and now she gets to go to jail and wear a little belt around her ankle for whoever knows how long. Hey, just eat and drink. It's a great idea. If there's no eternity, go ahead and do this. Isn't this a great way to live right there? You know what? There is an eternity is what he's trying to say. We live in a sex culture. We live in a sex culture. 50 to 75% of all Americans are somehow involved in pornography. We have a culture that is saturated with innuendo and sexual images, whether you're heterosexual or homosexual or transgender. We don't even know what, what, what it is anymore. By age 20, okay, by age 20, 75% of all Americans have had premarital sex. Okay, this is a, across, the, across the line. By age 20, 75% of all America has had premarital sex. By age 44, if, uh, if, if you're not married, 95% of all Americans at that point have. We are, we're a culture that's just given to sexual appetite. We are a food culture and a, and a gluttony culture. 67% of our culture is currently overweight. 25% of all the food that we purchase in our nation is going to be scraped off into the garbage and not even eaten. The average American is going to consume... 20 or 222 pounds of meat this year. Can't you smell that on the barbecue right now? 
Doesn't that sound good? 222 pounds of meat per person. I mean, eat, drink. Going to die. Might as well enjoy what we have right now because this is the end. That's what Paul's saying. If this is all we have, then just eat and drink and it's all going to be over like that. And the reality is, our culture and many of us, we are perishing under the weight of all these things and the excess of it. Verse 33 goes on to say, be not deceived. Again, we see a major point in the scripture and, and through the character of God that we are a people that are not to live in ignorance. God is not this nebulous cloud that floats to the sky that you can't really quite figure out. He has given to us understanding. He has given to us uh, guidance. And he has given to us precision of thought that we would know how to live this life in, in a way of, uh, of order, in, 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 in a way of context, in a, in a way of fullness. That's what God has for us, that we wouldn't have to guess at it, but we would know the direction that we have to go. I, I looked up this whole deceive thing in the scripture. I, I saw uh, four different occasions. Deuteronomy 11, Moses talks. He says, take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived and you turn and serve other gods and, and worship them. He says we can be deceived. The Bible tells us we can be deceived to follow other gods. Luke chapter 21, Jesus said, take heed that you be not deceived for many shall come in my name saying I am the Christ. And the time draweth near, go not after them. He says we can be deceived to go after other gods. We can be deceived to go after other religions, other churches, people that are false. First Corinthians 6, Paul says, Know ye not the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived. Then he makes this list. Neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adulterers, effeminate abusers themselves of mankind are going to inherit the kingdom of God. Don't deceive yourself. And we can go on. The list kind of goes on and on, right? God doesn't want us to be deceived. He wants us to be knowledgeable of what the truth is. He says, evil communication corrupts good matters. Or we may say birds of a, fo of a feather kind of flock together, right? You get, you get like the company you keep, bad company ruins, good morals. He, he, he's telling us, listen, uh, uh, the people that you hang out with, the communication, the testimony, the conversation of life that you're in, it's going to rub off on you. And, and I know that this verse was kind of used in, in my youth world to keep me from swearing, Right, and it was it was kind of said, uh, you know, don't swear. It's not right to swear, and and this. But that, he wasn't talking to children. He was talking to adults, he, he, because as adults, we are impacted just as much as the youth are by the people around us. You know, I, I listen to my my child. You know, she goes to a Christian school, uh, but she rides a, a, a public school bus, okay? <laughs> and, and she comes home and she has these little conversations with me, and I think, where did she get this from? The other day. We were, um, so, something was said on the TV, and, and we, we really do be careful of what we let our children watch. And my, my daughter looked at me and said, what the hell? I looked at her and thought, what the hell? What are you talking about? See, these things just rub off on us and our children. They don't know how to filter some of this, and sometimes neither do we. And it impacts us too. Some of the junk, and I mentioned this from the pulpit on Sunday, some of the junk we put in us, junk in, junk out, right? Evil communication, it corrupts us. It's dangerous. It, it, it's, a, it's about that lax moral lifestyle. What we believe does influence our behavior, if we don't believe the resurrection, if we don't look into eternity, then we won't live well morally. Now in verse 34, he says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have, the knowledge, some have not the knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. So this is a powerful statement uh, here. Uh, the whole chapter's been around resurrection, about reminding us of the eternality of life. Uh, and if we actually believe this truth, then we must be a people that awake, that wake up. W wake up, people. Hey, if, there, if there's a resurrection, if there's an eternity, then he says, awake to righteousness and stop 
sinning. There's people that don't have a knowledge of God, and I speak this to your shame. It's kind of a slap, isn't it? Saying, it's you. See, sin has a detrimental, has a poisonous impact on all of us. He says, wake up to eternity, to the, to the fact of the resurrection. We all live in a, a different way when we, when, we, when, we, when, when, when we think there's a value in this long term. He says, there's many that have not the true knowledge of God. I'm going to speak this to you. He, he's talking to the church that many, many people in this world have no real knowledge of God and his character, his truth, his love, his mercy, his grace, his redemptive story in all of this, his power, his justice, his authority, his purpose for all of us. You know, uh, I've, 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 I've had some unique experiences in my life. When, you, when, you, when I've been in Africa, I've gone into some villages in which uh, they saw me and my skin color and they ran away from me because they thought I was a Satanist. Okay, they, they taught the children of the village that when you see a Mzungu, this white man, that, that uh, he's a Satanist and, and it's witchcraft is involved right there, right? And so, well, you know, you go into this village and, you, and, and this is the mindset of these people and you begin to talk to them and you say, I, I want to tell you about Jesus. You know what? They have no idea who Jesus is. So what do you, where do you start with that? Where do you start with that? What would you do, Dan? You walk into a village, you walk into your office. The person says, you say, you know what, you need to come to church. Why? Well, we talk about who's Jesus. I don't know who Jesus is. I don't give a rip about Jesus. Where do you start with all? See, the world doesn't have a knowledge of God because the church has failed to appropriately give that knowledge. And we can talk about the villages of Africa, but I, uh, we can probably walk to some apartments and homes in Hilton around here too. And, and, and people will have a lack of true biblical understanding. Matthew chapter 5. Let's, let's flip there real quick. Matthew chapter 5. It's Bible study night. We can flip through our pages or swipe through our phones or whatever you like to do. Matthew 5 verse 13. This is Jesus speaking. And, and, and I, I get that people of this world, some of them live without the knowledge of God because they choose not to, right? And I realize when I read through Romans 3 that there's none that are righteous, there's none that pursue after God. Um, and, and I realize that sin separates us all from God. But many of the people of this world live without the true knowledge of God only because the church is not properly communicating the truths of our God to this world. Look at Matthew 5, verse 13. He says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle but put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that you may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in, in heaven. He says, man, salt has no value unless it's salty. Deep stuff, right? A light has no value if you hide it under a bushel. Remember the song, everyone? Hide it under a bushel, no. I'm going to let it shine. So we teach it to our kids. We just don't do it ourselves. I mean, really. I mean, what's it mean to let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works, that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven? It means we are to be the radiant light. We are to be the ones that are the communicators of God's truth to this world. The people of this world are to have a knowledge of God. Whether they receive that knowledge or whether they reject that knowledge is up to them, but they are to have an understanding of the knowledge of God because of the church. We are the, represent, we are the representation of Jesus Christ on earth. It is our responsibility to be the mouth, to be the hands, the feet, the heart to our community, to our world. As we live, 
in our schools, in our workplaces, in our communities, in our homes, whatever we do as a Christian, we are telling the world about God. And either we're representing the truth of God or we are falsifying him somehow. He said, we are to be a people. We are to be a people that communicate this. He says, hey, hey listen, a- awake to righteousness. Be, be holy. Stop, stop sinning. That's the whole Romans 6 principle that we went through. For some have not the knowledge of God. That's not cool. That's not, that's not an applause to us. You know, one of the things we do as a church staff is we talk about how do we reach people? How do we get more people to hear the, the life-changing message of the gospel? How do we get more people to be influenced by, by the truth? How do we get people to open up their Bibles? How do we get people to hear the Spirit when he speaks with that still, small voice? How do we do this? I mean, we have a tremendous sanctuary that holds 1,200 people. We have this beautiful facility that God has given to us and we have, that we're accountable to use and we're going to some stand before the Lord. How do we use all this so that the people in Hilton and Spencerport and, and, and Greece and Parma and Ogden, and all, that these people are going to know the reality of God. That's why the Lord has planted this church at 990 Manitow Road. So the people in this communities will have an opportunity to receive or reject based on the knowledge of God. That's our responsibility in all of this. It's the resurrection living that Paul is talking about. And when we believe in the resurrection, then we will live a life that is focused on eternity. We will lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven. We will desire to live forever. We will communicate that message. We will be changed by that message. But when we really don't believe it, when we really don't think of the resurrection, when we really don't think about eternity as having any value, then we don't care about the orphans. We don't care children that don't have parents. We don't care about the widows. We don't care about the hungry. And we certainly will never care about the criminal or those imprisoned, right? We won't care about personal holiness, about sanctification, or about righteous living, We won't care about uh, uh, much of anything spiritually. We won't go anywhere. We won't give anything. We won't grow. And we won't uh, live in any way that says eternity is, is important. We won't give the gospel. We won't go out of our way to tell, to show, or to model it. Because we really don't believe in the resurrection. So how are you living? Are you living a life that says, I believe that I'm going to live for eternity. And so I am living by the eternal book. Or are you just eating, drinking, planning to die? Because that's all that life's really about. He who dies with the moist toys wins. Is that how it goes? So let's just accumulate all we can for, for me. And if I'm really a nice guy, I'll accumulate all I can for my wife and children too. That somehow will make it better. Or I can plan to live for eternity. And in planning to live for eternity, I live by the eternal rule book in all of this. It's a shame, he says, that more of us don't partner up with God to be laborers together with him, to go into the fields that are already white unto harvest and, and be laborers to, to bring that whole thing in. And, and, and it doesn't mean that you have to go to the Ukraine. It doesn't mean you have to go to Haiti. It doesn't mean you have to give your life in Africa. We can be busy about our work, about our Lord's work right here and right now. See, I don't want the Lord to look at this church, this First Bible Baptist Church here, I don't want him to think that this church reminds him a whole lot of the Corinthian church. I want this to be a church that's not ignorant, that doesn't live foolishly, but lives intentionally in purposed lives in which the gospel is so very important to each one of us that we're living to give and to go and to grow because of it. And we're, living to, uh, we're willing to put some things aside 
and we're willing to swim upstream against the culture in such a profound and powerful way that the world looks at us and sees that we are so different because of Jesus. Awake, he says, to righteousness. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word this evening. Thank you for this very gracious people here tonight. God, I pray your blessings, your face would shine down upon each of us. Now, encourage us this time, Lord. May we walk by faith, and, and Lord, as you give us opportunity, may we speak the holy truth in the lives of the people around us. Help us to well represent you, whether we use words or we just live our life. God, help us to well represent you and, 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 and show the world that there is more than just these few years, Lord, there is an eternity. Bless us now, Lord, if there's someone in here that, that doesn't know the gospel, someone here that doesn't know what would happen if they were to die this moment. God, I pray that your spirit would bring forth a conviction of sin, and at the same time, your spirit would bring forth an understanding of grace. God, bring us to the place of hope and understanding. We pray all this now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So glad that you have been with us here this evening. Hope you have a great night. God bless you as you go.